May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. If you were here last Sunday, you may recall during the sermon that I was bloating a little bit, that I wasn't here the previous week and had to preach on that really tough gospel passage where Jesus tells us that we're supposed to hate our fathers and our mothers and our brothers and our sisters. I got a lot of joy out of not having to preach on that passage. Well, I guess what goes around comes around because this morning's gospel passage isn't much easier. As a matter of fact, many commentators call it one of the most difficult passages in all of Holy Scripture. One of the things that I do when I prepare for a sermon is I go to people that are a lot smarter than I am to see what they've written about a particular passage. And if, if the passage is particularly difficult, I consult even more of those really smart people. And I want to share with you this morning some of what those really smart people have written about this passage. One commentator writes, I have no idea what to make of this parable. <laughs> Another says this parable poses significant theological challenges. There's a lot of help there. This parable is difficult to read and even more difficult to preach. None of the parables of Jesus has baffled interpreters quite like the story of the dishonest steward. It is no exaggeration to say that this parable's meaning has stumped even the best and most creative interpreters of Holy Scripture. Very few chapters in the New Testament pose as many exegetical interpretation challenges as does Luke 16, and my favorite, major problems face the interpreter of this passage. <laughs> so, what do we do with a passage that is difficult like this? Well, first, I think it's helpful to identify and name exactly what those problems for the interpreter might be. And for me, the first problem in this passage comes in, chapter, in verse number 8. And his master commended the dishonest manager. So that, to me, is commending dishonest behavior. It seems a bit antithetical to what Jesus has been teaching for the last 15 chapters in Luke's Gospel, at least. But even more trouble is verse 9. Jesus says, and I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth. What do you do with that? Now, I don't claim to be near as smart as these people that have already explained to us how difficult this passage is, but for at least for the next six or eight minutes, I've got to say something about it. <laughs> so I think it's helpful to understand again where we are in Luke's gospel. If we go back a couple of chapters to the beginning of chapter 14, Luke sets the scene for us. Luke tells us at the beginning of chapter 14 that on one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of the leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath. So, Jesus and the disciples, we know that they're on their way from Galilee to Jerusalem. Jesus has set his face toward Jerusalem and the cross. And here, in this particular point, he's at a Pharisee's house. Now, I imagine that there's Pharisees, there's scribes, the disciples. It's probably a room full of people. But we also know that there's people in need of healing here because this is where Jesus heals for the third time on the Sabbath. So, big crowd, people of all sorts and manners. We've got really important people, we've got people in need of healing, we've got 
all the folks in the middle, a lot of people around. Jesus goes on to give us the etiquette lesson about taking ourselves out of the center of the story and letting other people sit in seats of honor. He tells another parable, and then Luke tells us in a gospel passage from two weeks ago that I didn't have to preach on, that large crowds were traveling with him. So now, we've gone from that setting of the Pharisee's house, but we're traveling. I like to think it's probably not far, because I think these other folks are moving with Jesus. And Jesus is teaching. This is where he gives us that really tough passage about hating father and mother and so forth. But right after that, Luke tells us again, now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. So now the group's getting even bigger. We've got this group of Pharisees, we've got scribes, we've got people in need of healing, now we've got sinners and tax collectors. And that's where our passage was last week. Jesus tells three parables about the Pharisees and the scribes grumbling that Jesus consorts with these types of people. And Jesus tells them three parables. Now remember, we only read two last Sunday, but it was the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin. And in response to this rumbling that these elites were doing about who Jesus consorts with, Jesus reminds them about who they should be counting. Those parables are about counting everybody, even the sinners, even the tax collectors. And then in the parable of the prodigal son, which we didn't read, Jesus bumps it up a notch, and he says we need to count even those that turn away and squander their inheritance, even them. But the challenge in that parable also is that not only do we need to count them, we also need to count the older brother. The older brother in that parable was left out. He was out in the field when the father was throwing the, the, the celebration with the fatted calf. So those three parables are about counting, making sure that we count each and every person in our families, in our communities, in the world. Then we come to chapter 16 in this incredibly challenging passage. I think it's significant that at the very beginning of this chapter, as soon as Jesus gets done telling those three parables to the crowds at large, Luke tells us, then Jesus said to the disciples, Jesus is addressing the twelve by themselves. I'm sure the other folks can hear, but Jesus is addressing the twelve. The leaders of the church, the ones who are going to take over for Jesus after his crucifixion and resurrection, the ones that will spread his message throughout the entire world, that's who he's addressing. And he said, and he tells them a story, and he commends dishonest behavior. I gotta think, he's not really condemning this dishonest behavior. Remember, he's being criticized for who he's hanging out with. I think what Jesus is telling the disciples here is be careful who you exclude because God's grace and mercy extends to everybody. God's grace and mercy extends to sinners and tax collectors. God's grace and mercy also extend to these unsavory characters that collect wealth through dishonest means. Jesus is telling us it's not our job to keep score. Whether we like it or not, whether we feel like the older brother and the prodigal son, how dare you throw a party for this guy who squandered everything? This is a continuation of that. Jesus is telling us, put the scorecards down, folks. It's not your job to keep score. God's grace and God's mercy is available to everyone, even those people that you go no way. Sisters and brothers, this is an incredibly difficult passage to understand. I hope 
that my interpretation is faithful to what Jesus originally intended. But I think if we use this, if we use it in the way that I've been preaching all summer, that these parables and these passages are meant to afflict us and to challenge us in some way of having a deeper relationship with God and living out though that relationship in our lives, I pray that this interpretation challenges us to do what Jesus is encouraging of the disciples, to extend God's grace and mercy to each and every person, even if we don't think they deserve it, because that's the way of the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of earth. And my prayer is that each and every one of us can live that out every single day. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.